Hello and welcome to the first trading day of the fourth week of 2024. Great to have you um, join us right here for Business Incorporated Live from Channels HQ. Here's what's coming up in the next 55 minutes. Lagos State Government bans the use and distribution of single-use plastics such as styrofoam in the state. Plus, we get policy expectations as CBN uh, releases a tentative 2024 meeting calendar. And in the oil market, you see oil prices lose more ground to start the week with Brent and WTI down. Great to have you join us. I'm Ladi Williams. Let's get the top stories that set your agenda now. We see the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, NNPCL, sends a plan to use the $3.3 billion uh, emergency crude repayment loan obtained from the African Export Import Bank in August last year uh, to meet its uh, operational needs and pay upfront tax and royalties accruable to Nigeria. According to the state oil company, the loan will also be um, used to stabilize the foreign exchange market by increasing the foreign reserve. It explained that uh, forward contracts such as um, this provide a more immediate solution to the FX liquidity needs of the federal government. At the same time, the NNPCL explained it had adopted a benchmark oil price of $65 per barrel uh, for repaying the loan, stating that it used that figure to insulate the repayment plan from the vagaries of oil prices uh, in the international oil market. Meanwhile, oil prices struggled to push ahead on uh, today as economic um, headwinds um, pressured the global oil demand outlook and offset um, geopolitical concerns in the Middle East and an attack on a Russian fuel export terminal um, over the weekend. That's weighing on prices. Now, since international oil price benchmark Brent crude fell uh, 0.1% to $78.47 a barrel, uh, while the front month U.S. Um, West Texas intermediate crude for February delivery edged up 11 cents to $73.52 a barrel uh, with a contract set to expire uh, later on Monday. The more active March WTI contract was at $73.21 a barrel, down $0.04. Cents. Meanwhile, analysts say that in the absence of any major escalation, crude is set for a range-bound trading with uh, some downward pressure. And the Presidential Committee on Fiscal Policy and Tax Reforms uh, says it's meeting with state governors in order to reach an agreement for states to suspend um, some low revenue taxes. The chairman of the committee, Mr. Taiwo Yedele, uh, made us known to journalists, says the uh, move would lead to the suspension of nuisance taxes by states and local government authorities across the country. And uh, not, uh, they're not adding value to government um, coffers. He explained that, among other things, the panel is expected to champion um, tax reforms and help the nation uh, to raise the much-needed tax revenue to enhance economic growth and development. The tax panel chairman lamented the, uh, that most of the taxes, especially those imposed on the transport of goods across the country, were negatively affecting the poor. And harmonization of taxes in states as uh, well as uh, agencies of federal government are major needs in the revenue um, generating environment of Nigeria. And this is according to Director of Obsidian uh, Akina Nigeria, Kelvin Emmanuel, it says it's necessary to boost uh, production and uh, stabilize the value of the Nigeria. He made the comments um, earlier uh, this morning. River State has 91 different taxes and levies. 91 that businesses pay in River State. I think Ogun State has anywhere around 42 or 43, if I'm not mistaken, you know, taxes that businesses pay. You, you can't have a situation like that. You know, you need to harmonize it and reduce it to the 10 that, they've, that has been stated and bring in info, integrate the informal sector into the formal economy and ensure that these 10 taxes and levies across federal units are the only taxes that are collected. They also need to... Um, suck in all the 62 MDAs into FIRS. I keep saying it. MPA, for example, you know, and all the other revenue generating um, MDAs, they, they don't have any business collecting revenues on behalf of the government. Customs, Nigerian Customs Service does not have any business collecting revenue on behalf of the Nigerian government. Nigerian Customs Service is supposed to be for trade facilitation, and it should be under the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, not Ministry of Finance. FIRS should be 
the one and final bus stop for all collections of taxes. And we got that news over the weekend. The Lagos State government's banned the use and distribution of single-use plastics, such as styrofoam, um, in the state. Uh, the Commissioner uh, for Environment and Water Resources, uh, Tokumba Wahab, uh, made a declaration in a statement uh, that was uh, yesterday. And we also have um, issues around the central bank's uh, a calendar for 2024. We're discussing um, these and uh, other issues with Mr. Sam um, Chidoka, Managing Director, Kairos um, Capital Limited. Um, great to have you on the show. First one uh, between us for the year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year and thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, great to have you. So quite a big move uh, by the Lagos State um, government there with this um, ban. Definitely will be... Uh, gauging enforcement you know going forward but definitely this would have an impact on producers of of styrofoams and uh, most of these um, um plastics um how are you seeing this move well so you, you've got to look at it from um not just the angle of um the effect it will have on the companies but you also have to look at the effect it has on the on, on Lagos state as as a base and as a state right we've seen so much pollution We've seen so much clogging of our drainage system um, by, the, by the users, end users of styrofoam. Now, it becomes difficult for governments to regulate use and to regulate um, cleanliness in the environment, but perhaps it's easier to stop this production and people can use other forms um, of containers that are less harmful to the environment and clogs um, our drainages uh, less more so. Um, personally, I'm not a fan of bans, but on this one, I stand with the Lagos State government. Uh, but, but looking at it, the timing, um, shouldn't the government, you know, give these, uh, give this kind of ban, you know, some time, you know, before, you know, enforcing, you know, to enable, you know, maybe most of these companies actually pivot, you know, give them time to pivot because this is going to, you know, impact their revenue, you know, going forward and employment at the end of the day. Yeah, well, valid point, uh, but... Again, many of the companies that are into production of styrofoam are also into production of various other plastic type products. What would generally change is the type of mode they use and what is the end product. I'm not aware that there are companies that produce styrofoam and that's all they do. Many of the companies into plastics and styrofoams and all of that actually have diverse uh, type of products and services they offer to their clients. So I'm guessing that what's happening to many of them is just a shutdown of just one arm of production. And I, I believe it should be fine. But ultimately, government has to make a call. If you look at videos that have been seen and research that has been done in terms of clogging of our drainage system and the flooding, attendant flooding that happens during the rains, um, I think the overriding public interest is more important. Yeah, definitely. We see Nigeria's plastic industry there. Uh, consumption of plastics in Nigeria grew about, uh, about 4 kilograms in 2007 to 6.1 um, kilograms in 2022. And uh, definitely this includes other forms of you know, plastic. But, but definitely I know we have a couple of companies listed on the NGX that you know, into production of you know, plastics and you know, I'm sure uh, styrofoams. Um, two, what are you seeing, how, do you, how are you seeing this impacting their you know, bottom line and top line you know, when uh, they send out uh, some of their reports? Definitely, this is just Lagos State, but who knows if other states would also um, do the same thing. Um, yeah, so you are right in that it is Lagos State, but the truth be told, Lagos State is the bulk of um, business. In terms of, um, if you look at in terms of growth in businesses, in terms of uh, tax collection, VAT collections in Lagos State, it outstrips most of, the, most of the states. And many of these plastic producers are actually based in Lagos. If you go to the solar access, you see many of the companies that produce um, these plastics. But yet again, like I said, there is a variety of public interest. Uh, on the NGX today, there are not many plastic companies that are listed. Uh, I know probably know of one or maybe two. Again, we do not expect that this will have a material effect on their bottom line and on their revenue because, again, it's just one side of their revenue that has been banned up. It is easier for them to pivot and do other things. But more importantly, we have to think about the 
uh, the ecological effects of some of these things. I mean, look at the video that is on that you're showing on the screen right now, and you can see that a good percentage of what is causing the pollution is styrofoam. Um, it's stuck to go. Yeah, definitely got to go. Um, thanks for that. But let's uh, look at all the burning issues now. I'm um, talking about, uh, well, it's, it's another year and uh, definitely apex banks, um, central banks globally are now um, gearing for policy direction, you know, in 2024. Um, some are already, you know, kind of meeting their targets, you know, when it comes to inflation um, at this point. But we can't say the same here. But we have dates now. Uh, for policy meetings in, in 2024. That was uh, released uh, over, uh, over the weekend, uh, I think on Friday, uh, by the CBN. We see the new dates. Um, definitely the first one is coming in February. If you can put the dates up uh, for me, we've seen the first one coming in February, then the subsequent um, uh, dates uh, for February, uh, we see it's uh, two dates um, there all the way to November. But this is a tentative. That means uh, there could be some changes, you know, um, going forward. So, uh, Mr. Chudoka, how are you seeing this? Um, how are markets uh, seeing these uh, dates? At least now we have dates, you know, at this point. Are the markets uh, relieved now? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a sign of relief that at least now we have dates. You remember that the last NPC didn't hold um, was, and then we didn't know what dates uh, that NPC were, would be holding. Um, now that we have the dates, is a sigh of relief from the markets because, you know, it's important that uh, when they meet, um, what happens to the monetary policy rate, whether it goes up or if they hold it or they decrease it. I believe the last time monetary policy rate was increased to 18.75%, and that becomes the base rate for which every other rate takes its function in the market. It affects the yield curve on the fixed income side of the market, and it affects even the banking rates, whether it's a bank rate or the rate at big banks are creating risk assets. So it's an important matrix in the economy. And again, we have seen inflation continuously rise. Now we're at um, 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 over 28% in terms of inflation. So you need to, we need to know what the policy direction is. We know that it's not entire economic policy direction that MPC comes up with. But at least on the monetary policy basis, it's important that we know. So yes, it's a sign of relief from the market. And we now have dates. All right, so we have the dates now, but the formation of the committee, you know, crucial for um, decision making, has not been established uh, as of yet. But definitely, I know the, the CBN should uh, communicate that to us um, soon. Uh, but how do you see what, what kind of uh, committee are you? Um, would you like to see, you know, at this point? We know at the end of the day, it's uh, it's about votes on either to hold or to raise or or to actually, you know, cut. But definitely, I don't think cuts is in the books um, right now for Nigeria. But what would you like to see, you know, for the first meeting in 2024 for Nigeria? Yeah, so I, I agree with you. Cutting of rates may not be in the books at, right now. But however, what I'd like to see is, I'd like to see, first of all, I'd like to see independence in the Monetary Policy Committee. You don't want a committee that is run by the central bank governor and whatever the governor decides and that's what stands. So you want to see people of integrity, you want to see people that know economics and understand not just the theory, but understand the practice and understand what the effect of the decisions they take at those meetings mean to the larger economy of Nigeria. So now we have dates. We are hopeful that the president will go ahead and appoint other members of that committee and that those members of the committee will be men and women who know they are onions as far as uh, economics is concerned, especially on the monetary policy side, and we begin to see the effect of the decision to take on uh, monetary policy and on the economy as a whole. So I expect that since we have February as the first meeting date, that sooner than later we will see the constitution of the committee. All right, definitely um, two issues before uh, the MPC uh, committee. Uh, for the first meeting, that's in February. Inflation uh, from December, 28.92%. And definitely they'll be working with data from uh, January, you know, also when, you know, the meeting comes. So um, looking at the Naira, you know, there's still pressure on the FX market on the Naira um, at this time. Did close um, week uh, last week and uh, in the parallel market, uh, the same thing. How do you see um, the CBN, you know, taming these two issues in the next uh, meeting and going forward in 2024? 
Well, um, a, 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 a fellow market, market analyst um, did say to me that when the CBN governor was uh, appointed, that he wished him the best, and he also uh, offered him some commiserations because it wasn't going to be an easy task. It's the same thing I would like to say to those that will be appointed into the committee. I wish them the best, uh, but also uh, offer them my commiserations because you are, you will come at a time when all the major indices in the, that we use to measure the economy are either on the downward spiral or pointing negative. Inflation is high, unemployment is high, the Naira is weak, rates, uh, exchange rates is beating up the Naira, and then interest rates is also high in the market. So everything that could, go, that could be difficult to handle, it's already difficult. What I would like to see the Monetary Policy Committee do is to focus. Let's have a focus, let's have a target. Perhaps we want to deal, first of all, with inflation and exchange rates. So focus on those two. If you focus on those two, we are hopeful that we can see, we, we've seen inflation has continued to rise, almost at 29%. We expect that maybe end of January will be closer to 30%, right? Um, but we need to drastically try and reduce inflation. So all the tools that are within the monetary, monetary policy confines to reduce inflation, whether you need to begin to also continue to tighten and increase the monetary policy um, rates, or whether we begin to cut government spending, or whether we begin to deal with the issue of the currency, because there's a relationship between a weak Naira and high inflation. The inflation we have is supply-side inflation, and also the Naira is weakened, and that affects and continues to drive inflation, because anything that is imported you have to sell at replacement cost. So I would expect the MPC to focus on reducing inflation and to also see how we reduce some of the capital controls on the FX market side and, and how we try and increase supply on a sustainable model. We borrowed some money, but I do not think that's sustainable. We have to find a sustainable model of generating income. Maybe we need to look again at agriculture, whether we have comparative advantage in setting crops, and we should be farming and exporting and getting much needed effects apart from oil and gas. Uh, talking about um, uh, sustainability at this point, we see the NGX, the All Share Index, has uh, hit more uh, all time highs. You know, last week, we're talking about 95,000 um, for the All Share Index, 95,000 points uh, uh, intraday. Right now, uh, businesses are battling, you know, rising costs amid, you know, sh shrinking, you know, consumer spending. Looking at the two issues of inflation and you know currency devaluation, help us understand how the stock market is still you know doing so well regardless of this uh, macro reality. Okay, so so the stock market is a beneficiary of what's happening in the in the economy as a whole and what's happening especially in the fixed income markets. When you have inflation at about twenty nine percent and you look at the fixed income market and yields on the market for one year paper, whether on the government side or on the corporate side especially, are in sub-inflation. So you're getting a negative carry, a negative return every time you invest in the uh, fixed income market. It's a negative real return when you adjust for inflation. So what do people do? You look for other places where you can get better return that either matches or surpasses inflation. And so there's a pivoting to the uh, equity market. And that's part of what the Nigerian, um, the NGX uh, All Share Index is benefiting from today. That's one. Another thing that we find is, remember, the pricing that you're seeing on the market is also a reflection of the economy trying to adjust for the devaluation in currency. If you look at the increase you've seen in particular stocks over time, and you adjust it for the devaluation of the currency, in certain stocks, we're not even fully recovered. So there is that revaluation in terms of what you expect as an upswing in equity and the devaluation in the currency. Secondly, there is some form of liquidity in the market from also the pension assets that are chasing 16 to 17 trillion naira in assets under management, and they are now pushing some of that into the equities market. Some foreign portfolio investors are coming back gradually because of the reduction in some of the capital controls we have had. So all of these things are working together for the good of the um, equities market. Because, intrinsically, some of the stock haven't quite done better. And finally, 
There has been some new listings. BFD Group got listed on the NTS. Mikio got listed. Those two stocks alone boosted um, the, the, the all share index and the capitalization of the exchange by over 60 billion naira. And so it's a good ride for the market. Right. Now, I guess we're expecting more listings in the 2024. So definitely that's also going to add, you know, to the market cap uh, of the NGX. But thank you so much for your perspective today, Mr. Sam uh, Chidoka, Managing Director at uh, Kairos uh, Capital Limited. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Welcome back. Let's head straight to markets now. We have Anita Edit uh, giving us the details uh, from uh, global markets that we're tracking right here yes, in Africa. Good afternoon, Great and to have you. Week. Even though your tie is red, the mm. local boss is green. I believe. Yes, I that think I, li I like the red, but don't look at the indicator on my tie because right. uh, this is just a dress attire, just an attire. Or is it a forecast? No, no, no. It's not a forecast. It's not a forecast. It's right. not a forecast. It's just red tie. Exactly. Nothing to see there. Exactly. <laughs> and that's in particular when you look at Nigeria's stock market is really what you call, would you call it bird journey? Not right. bird journey. You call it surging. But um, as a matter of fact, it's out of my description. So but I'll right. be giving you that details, especially at intraday trading before we get into the close of today's trading session the first for the week. Now, let's take a look at um, what the market is talking about. We're talking about markets within the regions, Africa, uh, Asia, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and the U.S. stock market. But let's start first with Nigeria, the stock market. Remember, we said sometime about this market, you know, climbing all the way from 75,000 into the 80,000 and then 85 and then now we're almost at the corridor of the 96,000 points. I, I checked the markets about some a uh, couple of uh, minutes ago and it, it was about 1.36% up at about 95,000, 826.86%. But take a look at your board. What we have here is 95,000, 981.31% in the green and that's for Nigeria stock market. Slowly the market is treading towards that 100,000 points. The blowout number which we've never seen, many of us, many, many of the market uh, participants have never seen that uh, number uh, for the index but that, that's it for that number and then we'll be giving you details of that at the close of today's trading session so now moving over to the other side of that market which we were seeing previously the, uh, Niger, uh, the South Africa stock market was the only loser there at intraday but then for the other markets the Egyptian stock exchange it was up by 0.76 percent while Kenya was up by 0.16 percent now, let's talk a little bit about another side of the market, but still within the Nigerian uh, financial markets. We're talking first about the FX market, as well as the recent announcement by the, the Central Bank of Nigeria that the, uh, its monetary policy committee will be having a meeting. Uh, they'll begin their first meeting next month. So the tentative calendar for that uh, monetary policy decision has been released by the Central Bank just uh, before the weekend there. So now let's talk to uh, our analyst, the Senator Aldu, a fixed income and forex dealer at Access Bank to give us more details about this market. First, starting with the forex market. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Hello, Senator. Thanks for having me, Anita. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions. First, I'm starting just two questions first. Um, we, we saw that uh, for forex transaction on the FMDQ, we saw the forex transaction there, the total value carried out there, uh, the total turnover carried out there was down by 13.53%. And then we also saw the Naira making a very, a very uh, moderate, or if I would say a significant comeback at 4.01%. So now give us details about this, as well as the fixed income market um, activity for last week. Okay, um, thank you. So beginning with the FX market, as you said, and we did witness I mean, moderation in the FX rate towards the end of last week. So we saw the FX rate, for example, close on Friday at 900 Naira 57 Kobo, um, down from 906 Naira and 10 Kobo. But we saw the NFM rate in Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange Market um, rate um, remain relatively stable at 902 Naira 45 Kobo. The turnover for Friday was $146 million. Um, so in that market, not much has changed. We continue to see um, demand significantly away um, supply. We've, we've um, seen some, some um, internationals come in, but not nearly enough to, um, to, of course, offset the demand that we have. Um, we are, uh, um, a lot of market participants are um, looking to, to, the, to the CBN for some guidance. And as you mentioned, the MPC um, calendar 
or the tentative MPC calendar was um, but the, uh, was was um, released um, last week. So we we see that the the MPC's Monetary Policy Committee is planning to meet six times for this year. The first meeting is on the 26th and 27th of February. A lot of market participants will be really interested to see mindset of the CBN to of course gauge market sentiment and make their projection. That's for the okay. Okay, so now no. fixed income side. Um, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so for the fixed income side, there's been some interesting announcement this morning about the bond market. We saw the DMO release a new calendar for the next quarter. Right, so there there had been four bonds on offer: the 2029s, the 2033s, the 2038s, and the 2053s. So in the new calendar, the 2053s, which were the longest bonds on offer, have now been dropped. So now we have four bonds with one new entrant on on the short end. So we have the 2027 bond introduced. So we have four bonds now: the 2027s, the 2029s, the 33s, and the 38s. Um, so we have those those four bonds on offer. Um, for the bills market, there's an NTB auction on Wednesday. We've continued to see um, rates um, trend downwards in, in that market. Um, the last auction, for example, the NTB auction, the one year closed at 8.399%. We've seen the CBN coming to conduct these OMO auctions. We, we saw the, the last OMO, the longest tenor offered, closed at 17.5%, down from 17.75%. So it's been interesting to see how the market trades this week. Hmm. Okay, so that, that's a well, very interesting. But now and that, that takes, you, takes me to my final question with you. Um, retain, raise, or reduce. What do you think that the CBN would do after six months lapse of not holding the um, uh, monetary policy rate, which is currently at 18.75%? What do you think would be the action in a month from now? So it's largely, um, of course, um, affected by... Um, inflation as well as um, economic growth targets of the CBN as well as the as, if, as the Ministry of Finance. So the the inflation figures came in at 28.92 percent, largely driven by food inflation at 33.93 percent. So these these rates would seem high uh, compared to the targets um, that we the regulators are. We may see some response um, um, by the MPC, the Monetary Police Committee, when they do meet. So it, it, our projections are that now, I mean, that, that might change before the, the meeting does happen a month from now, but I would think that there should be a marginal increase in the NPR from 18.75 to probably about 19%. But then again, it's if it will be the first MPC meeting under the new CBN government, so it will be really be the first time where we, we would have seen, we'll be seeing the committee in that context. So it give us a lot more direction on what they will do in the subsequent meetings. Mm. All right, so I think uh, so we're, we're satisfied with that analysis. And then, of course, we always keep our eyes on the market and expect um, we'll be looking forward to that meeting of the Central Bank's Monetary Policy Committee uh, later in February. Thank you. So that was uh, Senator Audu, fixed income dealer and forex dealer at Access Bank, giving us details about um, the forex markets as well as the MPC uh, decisions. Now, let's move over to the Middle East market where we see um, a kind of um, positive and then at some point, a slightly mixed, starting first with the United Arab Emirates, where we see the Abu Dhabi index um, in the pullback there at intraday 0.39% back in the red. And then for the Dubai uh, market, it was up by 0.05%, which you can see on your screen there. On the other side of the market, the other regions, particularly in Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabia Stock Exchange, where the Tadawu was up by 0.76%, and at the same time, the Qatari Stock Exchange, it was up by 0.81%. Uh, now, let's talk about the U.S. market, the stock futures. They were in the green. Most, most, of, it, uh, most of them were in the green, and this is building up on that, um, the, we saw the standard and poor's at the S&P 500 uh, reaching an all-time high as at Friday um, for that market. If we can have that on your screen there, we saw the U.S. Uh, stock futures, it was climbing. And this is because investors are seeking to build up on that, um, uh, on that all-time highs that we saw from the uh, standard and poor's 500 4,883.50%, which is what is uh, the, the futures is it pointing uh, towards this opening. The markets will be opening at about uh, 2.30 Nigerian time. So as at, uh, for, for today, the futures is up by 0.29%, almost about 0.3%. Uh, now for the Dow, Dow Jones Industrial Average is also up by 0.14%. We see earnings season, big banks, and some uh, other, other uh, factors playing into this market. 
Also for the NASDAQ, uh, the NASDAQ was also up by 0.53%. We talked about um, the tech heavies making that impact. And of course, when these tech heavies make, uh, may either make or mar the U.S. market, it also has its own uh, effect on that market. Now, let's move over to the final market, which is the Asia. Asia market, we saw um, only the Japanese um, index, which is the Nikkei 225, making a green 1.62% while all the rest in South Korea, the Kospi was down by 0.34%. For Hong Kong, the Hang Seng Index was, well, it took a very, very big bash in there with investors um, profit taking, uh, denting that market's uh, index. It was down, uh, pullback was 2.27%. Uh, and then for the other markets where we saw uh, for the Australia uh, up by 0.75%, and for the Shanghai, uh, the, that's Chinese market, the Shanghai Composite, was down by 2.68%. So, Ladi, that's right. it for the market. And, uh, of course, Niger stock markets, it's in the radar. In the radar. And uh, I guess, uh, as we uh, talked about earlier, 100,000, next level. Let's see if that uh, happens. I'm willing, I'm willing so, to pay, place a bet on that uh, 100,000. Place a bet. Make it, make all right. Really so, and it is betting all of his investments that is going to hit 100,000. This week. And if I win, I take all of your investments. But I'm not uh, betting anything. Most likely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Your pleasure. <laughs> Right. All right. So definitely we see a lot of uh, bullish sentiment right there in the markets, but we're checking out for today's um, close for the NJs. But let's head on to London now. Let's take a look at what's happening um, in the UK. Juliana joins us from our London studio. Uh, great to have you, um, Juliana. So we have some data out in the UK. Uh, we see that nearly 50,000 UK businesses are in critical financial distress. Um, seems um, UK firms are, are feeling the squeeze. They are feeling the squeeze. Good afternoon, um, Laddie. This is a, a pretty shocking number, actually, from the insolvency specialists, Begbie's Taylor. They have revealed data looking at the final quarter of 2023. And if you compare the data looking at the risk of insolvencies compared to the three months prior, it jumped by 26%. So there are roughly about 50,000 companies across the United Kingdom that are at risk of failure. And um, I believe it's a mix of a perfect storm of events, if you call it a perfect storm, which includes, of course, as we know, high interest rates, rampant inflation, weak consumer confidence and uncertainty um, about input costs. And I think really for most businesses, it's got to be down to the cost of borrowing. Um, it's been a really difficult 18 to 24 months for UK firms. Yes, many of them benefited from some of um, the, the, the financial schemes that were put in place by the Conservative government when Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Many of um, them benefited uh, from furlough and, of course, grants. But what they were able to do once we opened up is that they were able to use cheap borrowing to kind of cover up the cracks. But we know that borrowing is anything but cheap anymore. Uh, since we opened up from the pandemic, inflation interest rates have risen uh, from 0.1% to where it is today at 5.25%. So it's just incredibly difficult uh, to borrow. We know the labour market is stretched because so many people in the United Kingdom are suffering from the symptoms of long COVID. And because of the impact that uh, COVID has had on the NHS, it's just very, very difficult to get an, import, um, an appointment. So this all feeds into the data. This is all of the context uh, behind it. And it is absolutely alarming because as any functioning economy is aware, it is the SMEs and that are the engine behind economic growth. So, yes, really, really uh, alarming. And um, it puts pressure on Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, uh, to do more to help beleaguered businesses uh, when he announces um, the items within his spring budget. Right. And I guess when you're tackling inflation, you, you do that, you know, at the risk of, you know, uh, businesses and economic uh, growth at the end of the day. So the uh, serious balancing act for 2024, I guess we uh, that's what we have to see. But I will see uh, forecasters at the EY um, Item Club. That's the UK Economic Forecasting Group. They say Britain uh, may well have slipped into recession at the end of uh, 2023. How's this data being seen there? Well, it's 
Yeah, it's quite interesting, actually. I suppose with forecasts such as this, it depends on how you interpret the data, because in the UK, in terms of the Financial Times et al., uh, they're actually saying the opposite of what EY Item Club um, have said. Um, and to be fair, the EY Item Club, really important forecaster, because they use uh, the financial modelling, which has been adopted by uh, the UK Treasury. So anything the EY Item Club says, uh, the British government do take it very, very seriously. And like I said, it depends because, of course, we know data can be distorted depending on who's uh, reading it. But actually, um, what they are saying is that they do believe that there will be a, um, some elevated growth in the UK economy this year. Yes, we may have um, entered into a technical recession. We're still waiting on final GDP data for 2023. But of course, we're not looking back in the rear view now. We're looking forward. And they did have a forecast in October saying that they expected GDP to expand by 0.7% this year, they've actually uplifted that and they believe it could be a 0.9%, which is good news. And I think why they are saying this is because they're looking at the Bank of England and the fact that their um, inflation um, benchmark is at 2%. And um, economists at EY actually believe that by May we could potentially uh, reach 2%, which would be amazing because the cost of living crisis is still a massive squeeze on British uh, consumers. And of course, as we know, if it does go down to 2%, which is the benchmark rate, uh, then we can start seeing interest rates go down, which means it's cheaper to borrow. And uh, these, uh, you know, 50,000 businesses on the brink of collapse will be able to use cheap debt to conceal the cracks again. So yeah, really interesting. Uh, the UK economy, massive focal point this year. We're heading into a general election. Uh, Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party here in the UK expected to win that election. He was giving a speech to civil society today, basically saying that we need to do so much more on the UK economy. So expect uh, the economy to enter with politics as uh, we go to the polls um, sometime soon. Right. Half the world heading to the polls in, in 2024. We do see central bankers yeah. um, globally telling investors to manage um, their rate cut uh, expectations in 2024. Uh, let's see if it actually um, happens. But how are markets um, looking in the UK and what market moving data are we expecting this week? Yeah, pretty decent. We've we've got a storm actually. I had to really, you know, hold on to the top of my head uh, this morning. <laughs> that has um, caused significant travel disruption um, across uh, the UK. Not a great way to start the week. Uh, Cancelled flights, rail and um, motorway closures. Uh, but the UK blue chip index is in tip top shape. The all shares up up by 0.26%. FTSE 100 laddie that's up by 0.17%. And the FTSE 250, the domestic market up again by 0.69%. In the currencies market, the British pound is currently trading up against the US dollar by 0.03%, though it's down against the euro by 0.01%, but up against the Japanese yen by 0.05% at intraday, laddie. But I guess um, when there's a storm, um, ladies need to focus on holding their hair down, you know, at this point. Because <laughs> those hairs are really expensive. Thank you so much, <laughs> Julieta. Very we'll embarrassing. I know, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Juliana. All right, now let's head on to Europe now. See, for two months, uh, the Houthi attacks and ships in the Red Sea have affected the shipping industry and uh, trade worldwide. The European uh, cruise ship industry is also adjusting um, schedules uh, at this point. Lars Holter joins us now uh, from Berlin. Um, great to have you, Lars. So what are you um, hearing uh, from the cruise ship operators? Thanks for having me, Ladi. Uh, yes, let's look at Swiss Italian operator MSC Cruises. They are telling us that they have cancelled three trips that they had planned. They were planned to take tourists from South Africa and the United Arab Emirates to Europe. And those trips would have gone through the Red Sea into the Swiss Canal. Now, that's certainly an interesting route under normal circumstances, but it's impossible to do right now due to the crisis in the Red Sea. MSC says, uh, quote, the safety 
of passengers and crew is the number one priority, and the company has regrettably had to cancel the voyages. Uh, since those three cruise ships, however, are needed for cruises in Europe, MSC will now transfer them without any passengers on board and avoid the Red Sea, so likely they're taking the long route around Africa. As for competitor Royal Caribbean, they have also canceled two voyages so far, one from Muscat in Oman to Dubai that would have actually been going on right now as we speak, and another trip from Dubai to Mumbai, which had been scheduled for early next month. Are these minor incidents or could this be a bigger problem for the industry? Not really. These are just a handful of trips, uh, so far I should say. At this rate, the cruise industry will barely notice this crisis. Now, of course, a few thousand passengers are affected, but uh, given the size of the industry at a global level, the impact here is not expected to be significant. One analyst looked at the current itineraries and uh, he said that, uh, quote, this is a small part of their overall fleet and multi-year itineraries, uh, so they will be able to overcome this easily. Partially that's also due to some companies being surprisingly flexible. Again, let's look at that Swiss Italian company MSC. They did have to cancel a Suez transit at the start of its eastbound 121 day world cruise, but they didn't have to cancel the whole tour of course. That ship, the MSC Poesia, is now circumnavigating Africa instead to start its journey around the world and the ship is even sticking to the same number of destinations uh, that is uh, 50 ports to be precise, as well as the original itinerary highlights. All right, so brand new week. What investors looking at in today's markets? Well, first of all, I guess U.S. investors are still enjoying a few hours at the top. The S&P 500, of course, hit an all-time high just as it was heading into the weekend. However, the air is thin up there and we'll have to see if shares can climb even higher. Much of the rally recently was based on strength in tech companies, Apple, Amazon, Meta and Nvidia mostly. And uh, then, of course, you always have to keep an eye out on monetary policy. Investors have based much of recent gains on bets on lower borrowing costs, but those might not come as quickly as uh, some might have been expecting. More and more Fed officials have been trying to signal to markets that rates shouldn't drop too soon. Uh, much of Asian and European markets today will likely be tied to the US. So in early trading, we're not seeing much in terms of a trend. All right, thank you so much uh, for the um, update there. That was Lars Holter right there in Berlin, giving us the details uh, from Europe. Now, let's uh, look at the um, energy crisis in South Africa now. See, the managing director of uh, Reputation First, uh, Shepo Maseba, uh, says South Africa's energy insecurity presents the biggest risk to the ruling ANC's um, prospects of winning this year's election. Africa's most industrialized economy has battled the 15-year power crisis and has left the nation without electricity electricity for up to um, 12 hours a day. Well, uh, Maseba added that the country's uh, crippled economy will be top of mind for voters uh, when they head to a general election later this year, uh, which marks the third decade that the ANC has been in power. Maseba was uh, speaking to our business uh, correspondent uh, right there in South Africa. Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of uh, challenges that will uh, affect the, the, the elections and the, uh, how people participate in, the, in those elections. Uh, uh, one of those is, is the, of course, the energy crisis, the fact that um, uh, more often than ever, we are, we are in the dark for the longest of time during any given year, and uh, the, the, the energy sector is unpredictable. So we never know whether we're going to have uh, energy for a sustained period, so you can't plan. And, you know, in business, uh, investors need to plan, but also um, uh, the lack of electricity provision affects poor people, uh, meaning that they can't cook, uh, they cannot uh, perform basic uh, necessities and that children actually go to school uh, without warm water. And uh, that's at a, at a poverty and realistic level across, as, as, uh, you know, South Africa. And so that will impact the, the ANC. But uh, additionally, uh, there are a few other challenges, one of which include the high levels of youth unemployment. 
where as so many young people wake up, in fact, someone from Statistics South Africa said there are many young people who wake up every day and do absolutely nothing, meaning that they are not in education, they are not in training, and they are not in employment, and they are also not looking for employment because they've lost hope. And so that will be a biggest challenge for the ANC. And then the third one is crime and, and violent crimes. Uh, when you look at the number of murders that are committed per quarter and contact crimes in South Africa, walking in the city, for example, of Johannesburg uh, is very risky uh, uh, today. Um, and so that, that will be a major challenge. And importantly, um, the lack of response uh, or coordinated response by the police in dealing with crime is, is, a, is a major um, hurdle. Now, generally speaking, when you think about other, there are many other factors, including the, the logistics crisis in the country, which President Sir Ramaphosa says he's addressing through collaboration with business. Oh, Sako Maseba there giving us uh, the details on the energy crisis right there in South Africa. But uh, from there now, we head to um, other markets. Take a look at what's happening in the crypto market. And we see the color um, in the market there. It's um, full on red. Um, some would say blonde on the street uh, at this point. There's uh, technically no green on this uh, map. Just a little old green here. But everything else um, is in the red. This is post um, Bitcoin spot ETF approval. And we're seeing a lot of sell offs in the market. Could this Bill, uh, could this be the, the sell the news um, impact right here in the crypto markets? So I was seeing a bloodbath. Uh, some will call it a uh, buying opportunity. Some will say uh, it's time to get out of the market, but who knows? Let's uh, look at the uh, top um, stories now. We see um, DYDX, um, that's one of the uh, cryptocurrencies in the market there. Uh, they're planning to unlock some um, tokens um, at this point. You know, some investors are getting early, are able to get um, uh, below some of the prices we see now. So they're going to be getting um, some of their tokens and who knows what they're going to do with that. Are they going to hold it or are they going to sell it? So definitely it's going to impact the um, price of the DYDX um, token. Um, other um, news we have there now, we see Bitcoin, uh, yeah, definitely down post ETF um, approval. Most investors were expecting, you know, the Bitcoin spot ETF approval. Some said this would uh, keep uh, Bitcoin, you know, bullish all the way to 100,000, but we're seeing major pullback um, post um, ETF approval. So some investors might be taking profit at this time, selling the news uh, when it's uh, finally uh, arrived at this time. Um, other stories we have there, 640,000 um, Bitcoins are held by U.S. Um, Bitcoin ETFs. That's after the approval now. And definitely we know they're only going to be 21 million bitcoins ever uh, minted you know at this point so about 640,000 um 640,000 bitcoins are now held uh, right now with the in the etfs um that have been approved so we we'll see the um fear greed index it's still a greedy market but less than what we're used to this has always been around the 70 points um level did such extreme greed at some point but we're seeing um, a pullback from there so who knows are we going to be seeing neutral next um now that we're seeing um 55 um, points. Let's bring in Rume Ofi now, a financial market analyst. Hello, Rume. Great to have you. Hello, Ladi. Thank you very much. Fantastic. So we're seeing uh, major sell-offs in the market right now. It's uh, blood on the street, post-ETF um, approval. Did you expect this? Yes. Uh, same reason why you always call me Rume. Yeah, uh, truth is, aside the uh, <laughs> uh, Buying robots, selling the news. Uh, aside that, it has faded already. Uh, a lot of things are happening now. The price, the real price of Bitcoin, we're going to see uh, the narrative is gone. And that's why you see the market going down. In the long term, the market is going to make a whole lot of sense. But for now, uh, considering the fact that a whole lot of things are happening, still seeing a very strong economy in the US, uh, tech companies' earnings are going to be coming this week. A couple of job figures that have come out uh, last week and a couple of things, it shows that the Fed still has a lot of work to do. And if you take a closer look, you'll see that 10-year uh, U.S. yield is actually coming up uh, higher, which means it poses a huge risk for risky assets. So a couple of persons jumping into uh, the main coin rave here and there for some of the day one blockchains. I usually tell them for some, some time now, a couple of them are making me feel like I'm not, I'm not helping them to make money. But the truth is, you have to be careful so that you don't lose money as well. You know, all of these things are playing a role. still have a geopolitical crisis still going on right there. So it's settling off. 
weeks and months, we're going to see the true price of Bitcoin. Then we'll see some uh, consolidation, then market turn again. But from now to the halving factor, I don't see anything uh, solid coming from Bitcoin in the next six months. I, I, I have to say the truth right here. We need to really play safe. Everyone involved in this industry. The afterwards, again, uh, we see something coming out. We see the Bitcoin uh, market cap will be no eight hundred billion dollars. Some persons feel like I need mean, a couple of persons will freak out today. <laughs> it is what it is. Right. It is what it is at this point. And, you know, looking at uh, data coming out um, this week, we know in the U.S. expecting, you know, Q4 GDP data and you know, some other uh, uh, economic uh, data coming out uh, this week. Is, is there any um, catalyst, you know, you think might be able to propel Bitcoin um, higher on the data front? So for now, there's no narrative pushing Bitcoin. There's no narrative pushing Bitcoin now. The ETF actually, you see, when the news came up as fake news on Crytelegram, the market went from the 30s to early 40s down to 48,000. Right now, it's a time for some form of um, reconsideration of portfolios so that uh, you are not caught on our This is an election year. Expect a lot of volatility. And definitely, you know, talking about volatility and all the expectations um, going forward, we now have the spot Bitcoin um, ETF approved. So how would you, what would you say is the best strategy, you know, this kind of market? Now we're seeing a major pullback from $46,000. 50K um, didn't come. So what would you say is the best strategy um, for the average investor, you know, trying to get into the crypto market? Or just so now I, I, I would advise Nigerians, Africa alike, that this is not even the best time to do dollar cost average. I posted it on social media a few minutes ago. I'm not doing dollar cost average. I'm not doing anything. Uh, let's the, let the outfit time come and go. And uh, afterwards, when we start seeing uh, consolidation in the market, then we'll start uh, getting a few things. So I'm, I'm looking, at, looking at a possible price down to early 30s down 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 uh it's not a time you where you want to really jump into so for example you buying now you doing your dollar cost averaging now and your favorite cryptocurrency goes down about 60 percent makes zero sense you know so what i would advise somebody coming into the industry to do get a lot of education uh get a couple of people that are involved in the industry then but all of the chat movement is going to give sign uh, that this is the time where you can start doing your dollar cost averaging or you know, but going all in now, something you won't like because it makes zero sense. A lot of uh, drawback have been happening. I've been saying this since last year, but uh, it wasn't making enough sense because this is just a relief rally. A couple of persons are saying it's a bull. Run. It is not a bull. Run. Hold on for a while, and you can think of coming to the market when it's just uncertain. Now, uncertainty is very, very high in the market. So nobody knows what is going to happen in the U.S. election. Uh, it is usually said that when Republicans are in power, Usually see rally in stock and other things. So, I venture that could happen towards the, the end of the year. So, so I guess according to Rume, it's not um, uh, this is not the time to follow Warren Buffett's uh, style of trading. Uh, buy where the market is fearful. But I guess the market is not even fearful yet. Maybe fear is starting to set in, but not fully, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's actually preparing for, for a dump and trying to catch a lot of people unaware. So the ETF the narrative is like a trap that took, took a lot of people in. So this is not a time to buy when everybody's getting scared. This is a time to observe, learn even more better so that you can have sustainable wealth building strategies. So I guess learn when the market is fearful. That's Rume's um, <laughs> giveaway there. Thank you so much, uh, Rume Ofi, financial market analyst. Thank you. Thank you, man. All right, let's look at the gainers now in the market. Uh, we see Bitcoin down 2.24%, Ethereum not left out, 3.26%. Big drop uh, from Cardano, that's lost the 50 cent level, 5.09% uh, down, XRP 53 cents, 3.58%. Uh, let's look at the top gainers, we see Manta, one of the new coins there, 1.42%. Lean gains, what we're seeing this uh, this afternoon, $2.40. Um, $2 DYDX, they are expecting that unlock coming, but it's up marginal, 0.42%. Uh, 
CTSI, one of the um, old ones there in the market, 25 cents, uh, still um, holding there. Let's look at the loses counter now. We'll see, uh, say that's um, down 12.17%. So we're seeing double um, digit losses at this point. Chili's, uh, what the fan tokens, bonk, meme coin, that's down 9.16%. So we're seeing profit taking uh, weighing um, on this uh, market right now. So um, that's the show today. That's how the markets are looking. Remember, you can visit uh, um, channelcv.com for more updates. Um, Laddie Williams from me and the team um, right here at Channels HQ in Lagos. It's bye for now.